All right, let's um, read our praise passage for this lesson. Um, please take out your program, and we are going to read a psalm, one of my favorites. Psalm 145 is, I don't know, when I say favorites, okay, I have like 50 favorite psalms because they're all so wonderful, but this one really is in my top five or ten, I guess. It's a beautiful psalm of praise to our God. And one of the things that I think makes it just uh, outstanding is it is such a beautiful picture in the same psalm of the transcendence of God and the eminence of God. The transcendence of God, just that he is so high. He is so different from us. He is high. He is holy. But then in some of the verses in Psalm 145, it stresses his eminence, that he is so close. He is near to us. He raises up the bow downs. He hears us when we pray. He's so close to us. So you see both of those things pictured in Psalm 145. If you like to memorize scripture, and I would encourage you to do that whenever you can, this is a great one to memorize. All right, let's read it together. We're only going to read the first 10 verses together, and then we will get into our lesson. I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you, and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and highly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wonderful works, I will meditate. Men shall speak of the power of your awesome acts, and I will tell of your greatness. They shall eagerly utter the memory of your abundant goodness and will shout joyfully of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and great in loving kindness. The Lord is good to all, and his mercies are over all his works. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and your godly ones shall bless you. All right, let's pray. Father, as we ponder who you are, we are overwhelmed with your greatness, Lord, with your holiness, with your goodness. You are such a great God, and truly, as the psalm says, your greatness is unsearchable. And Lord, we bow at your feet in worship, and yet we also ponder your mercy and your compassion and your kindness to us as your children. You are such an amazing God, and we love you. Lord, we thank you for not only who you are, but for your precious word that you have given us. Lord, it is so full of wisdom. Lord, it is so full of exactly what we need just to go through this life day by day. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he came, that he died for us on the cross, that he has redeemed us. Lord, that he rose again and he conquered death. Lord, we just thank you that there's nothing we could ever have done to merit what we have been given. And I pray that our lives would just be pictures of gratitude for you, just for you and what you've done. Lord, we praise you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you that he is our teacher, that he convicts us, that he leads us, and that he guides us. And he quickens your word to our hearts. I pray that we would have teachable hearts just as we study your word. And that we would learn from you that you would make us more like your son. Lord, I pray for every lady who is here. I thank you that you have brought them here. And I pray that you would take your word and apply it to whatever they are dealing with right now, whatever joys, whatever sorrows. I pray that you would meet their need like nothing else can. 
And Lord, we know that you will be faithful to do that. I ask for your help, as always, that you would guard my mouth, guard what I say, and that you would uh, give me the words to say. I pray that it would be honoring to you. In your precious name, amen. So, last night, we looked at those first three balances, all right, the balance between family and ministry, the balance between self-denial and liberty, the balance between patience and confrontation, and we understand that it's easy to get off balance either side on all those issues, and we have a few more today that we're going to look at. And same thing, we have to be careful because it's so easy to go to the extreme on some of these things. Our fourth category is the balance between temporal and eternal. All right, what is temporal? What does that mean? It means being concerned with the things of this earth. All right, it's about this world. What is eternal? That's very easy. It just simply means being concerned with eternal things, with spiritual things, with the things that we can't see. Being mindful of temporal things, of worldly things, does several things. It keeps me realistic, it keeps me involved, and it keeps me responsible in my earthly pilgrimage on this earth. And it also reminds me to be grateful for God's creation, for this world that he has given us to live in. Um, The temporal, okay, I've given you several scriptures there. The temporal, if we're not careful, can consume us because it can take so much time. Let's look at a few scriptures. Genesis 1.31 says, Then God saw everything that he had made, And indeed, it was very good. Uh, You study Psalm 104. That is a psalm that is full of praise for this beautiful world that God has given us. Proverbs 27, this is a scripture that says, Know well the condition of your flocks and pay attention to your herds, for riches are not forever. Now, I do understand that not too many of us have We don't have to worry about our flocks and herds, okay? I've never had a flock. I've never had a herd, but you get the point. What it means is whatever your vocation is, pay attention. Work hard. Whatever vocation, whatever work, whatever responsibilities the Lord has given you, do a good job, okay? Give it your best. Pay attention. Uh, Proverbs 31, again, we mentioned last night the The excellent woman, the Proverbs 31 lady, she was one busy lady. Okay, you read that that, uh, chapter, and she was busy all the time taking care of her earthly responsibilities. She was looking out for her husband, looking out for her children. Those are very reasonable, God-given responsibilities. But even though there's a time to think about temporal things, we also need to be thinking about eternal things. Um, Have you ever heard that old scripture? uh, Not scripture, it's a saying. It says, you know, he was so heavenly minded, he was no earthly good. Okay, I don't want to be no earthly good. Nobody wants to be no earthly good. But the truth is, we need to be heavenly minded. We are told to be heavenly minded. We need to be concerned with pouring ourselves into eternal things. And there are very few things in this world that are eternal, okay? God, our relationship with God, his word, his word is eternal, and you, other people. People will live eternally somewhere And that's about it. Everything else around us, everything else you can see, someday is going to burn up. It's going to be gone. There's very few things that are actually eternal. So we need to be pouring our life, our time, into the things that last. Just remember, ladies, there are two kingdoms in this world. There is the kingdom we see 
the kingdom of this world, and there is the kingdom of God. And that is what we don't see, the unseen things. What are some scriptures that deal with the eternal? Matthew 6, it tells us Jesus is talking, and he says, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on this earth. Okay, lay up treasures in heaven. Philippians chapter 3 says, our citizenship is not here. Where is our citizenship? It's in heaven. That if you know Christ, your citizenship lies in heaven. I love Colossians 3, 1 and 2. What does it tell us to do? We set our minds on things above. So we should be heavenly minded. But again, there is a balance. We have to take care and be responsible and attend to our temporal responsibilities, but we can never lose sight of that unseen world. Now, what are the extremes? Okay, if you are too heavy on that temporal side, here are the symptoms. Here is what you will observe in your life. There will be an overemphasis on worldly success, worldly achievements. That's just going to mean too much to you. It's going to take up too much of your time. Um, and that very naturally leads to materialism. You're going to be all wrapped up in the material things of this earth. And if you're wrapped up in material things and you're all about gathering those things, then that leads to fear and anxiety that you might lose that stuff. Okay, we have a lot of stuff. I am currently in the uh, process of cleaning stuff out of my house. And I don't know how I accumulated so much. So I guess you have stuff too. So we have to be careful. We don't get too wrapped up in our stuff. You can be excessively preoccupied with temporal issues or causes. Okay, And the key word there is excessive. Okay, again, we have to pay a certain amount of attention, uh, attention to just living in this world, but we can go to the extreme. Um, some of you may know I come from Houston, and uh, how many of you have ever been to Houston? Okay, uh, what would you say about Houston besides the fact that it's horribly hot and humid? Okay, now, uh, you've got the heat here, okay? You win the temperature heat, but I promise, Houston wins the humidity contest, okay? It is very hot and humid. The other thing that Houston is, if you've ever been there, is flat, okay? It is flat as a pancake. And so I remember when we moved to uh, Los Angeles back many years ago, all of a sudden, I saw these mountains, okay, these huge, rugged mountains. And I, we were there 16 years. I don't think I ever got tired of looking at the mountains because all I knew was flat, okay? My husband used to say the only hills in Houston were the freeway overpasses. That was it. <laughs> but in Los Angeles, they have those huge mountains, and you have them here, all around Phoenix. And I remember we would be driving to church on Sunday mornings, and we would always see these. And we would just go, oh, look at that, look at that mountain. Look at how the sun's peeking over the mountain. And 16 years later, we were still saying the same thing. So I love the beauty of God's world that he created for us to live in. I love a beautiful sunrise or sunset. So I appreciate nature and what God created. But, you know, I don't go around hugging trees, okay? I'm not a tree hugger. I remember when we lived in Los Angeles. Maybe you will remember this. Um, there was a couple of times there was like a, a big, beautiful tree, and they were going to cut it down, and somebody would climb up in the tree and live there for a few months. Do you remember that? <laughs> it's like, those Californians, they're, they're different. Um, I love trees, but I don't climb up and live there for three months. Um, you know, I don't demonstrate for the, the baby seals. They're very cute, and I love them, but I don't march for them. I mean, you just have to be careful. Um, you know, I have seen people, and I have seen Christians who got way too 
caught up in those kind of causes, you know, environmental stuff. I mean, I do recycle. I've got that green thing. I'm a, I'm a faithful little recycler. I want to be a good citizen, so I do that. But you have to be careful that that doesn't consume you. That doesn't become everything. And for many people, it does. And even Christians can get too caught up in there. It's too important. I mean, you know, you see these signs, you know, save the planet, save the earth. And when I see those signs, I always think, good luck. Um, Have you read the book of Revelation? Okay. (laughs) You are not going to save this planet. No matter what you do, no matter how much you recycle, God tells us this this old earth is going to be burned up. Okay? So we have to keep God's truth in our minds so we approach these things in a balanced way. Um, Next, you can put, again, undue emphasis. Okay? You can put too much emphasis on certain philosophies or ideologies of this world, and this can be many different things. Uh, It could be, last night I mentioned the issue of schooling, okay? Schooling can become everything to people, okay? I have, and I was a homeschooler, so I say this out of love. I'm not criticizing homeschooling or any other kind of schooling. Uh, We homeschooled for many years, and I loved it. But I have seen people that have put all their eggs in the basket of homeschooling, okay? That that's going to solve all the problems of the world. It won't. I'm sorry. Um, I've seen people do that with politics, okay? I have seen Christians get so caught up in politics as if that's the answer. And I hate to tell you, but that is not the answer, okay? Only Christ is the answer, all right? And it doesn't mean you can't be involved. It doesn't mean you shouldn't be a good citizen, fulfill your responsibilities. But be careful that it doesn't become everything, all right? I've seen people do this with uh, health-related things, health things, exercise, um, diet, um, uh, essential oils. That's come out. Okay, there's benefit in all those things, okay? I have some essential oils in my closet. There is benefit in those things. But when I pick up from somebody that they're kind of saying, this, this is it, this is the answer, I get a little nervous, okay? So be careful that you maintain a balance in some of these things. So that's being too consumed with the temporal side. You can, believe it or not, be too eternally minded, okay? If you are so eternally minded that you are actually neglecting your God-given responsibilities, you're off balance, okay? If you are ungrateful for the beauty of God's creation, you're a little off balance. If you don't take care of what God has delegated to you, okay, yeah, you need to take care. If he gave you a yard, you need to mow it every now and then. If he gave you a house, Make it look nice, okay? Paint it if it needs painting. You can also, if you're too eternally minded, you can, and we don't think of this sometimes, but you can, I think, lack compassion for other people who are going through suffering, okay? We have to be careful that we don't use scripture verses like band-aids. You know, somebody's going through something and it's just rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. That is true. But sometimes we need to just sit down and weep with those who are weeping. Sometimes the best thing you can say is nothing. All right, just sit there and cry with them in their sorrow and give them hope. But we have to be careful that we're not so eternally minded that we cannot empathize and have compassion with people who are going through great trials in this temporal world. All right, so that is the balance between temporal and eternal. The next one, balance I have called inner man and outer man. Okay, we all have an inner man and an outer man. And the Bible definitely makes a distinction between these two parts. 2 Corinthians 4 says very clearly, our outward man 
is perishing, and it is, believe me, as you get older, that, that outer man just starts falling apart. Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Now, when I'm talking about the inner man, what do I mean? The inner man is who we are on the inside. The inner man includes many things. The main things would be our thinking, our conscience, our will, our desires, our affections, our emotions. These are all part of the inner man. God made us in his image. Okay, so we have all these, these things because we're made in the image of God. Just so you'll know, the word heart is basically synonymous with the word mind in the scripture and also the inner man. Those three things are all talking about the same thing. A famous scripture, 1 Samuel 16, 7, where God is speaking to the prophet And remember, it was where he had gone to see the sons of Jesse. He's looking for the new king. And he sees one of David's oldest brothers, and he says, oh, okay, he's a good-looking guy. That must be him. And what does God say? For the Lord does not see as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, the outer man, but the Lord looks at the heart. Okay, Uh, Proverbs 4.23 says, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it, out of the heart spring the issues of life. And so the inner man is absolutely crucial because out of the inner man come the issues of life. But the Bible does not ignore the outer man. Okay, it has some things to say about our outer man as well. And so in your syllabus, I've given you a few scriptures that relate to our appearance, and especially as Christian women, to the issue of modesty. Now, um, in case you have not noticed, we live in an incredibly immodest world, all right? And it is getting worse all the time. And you know, it's funny, I teach on this occasionally. I actually have a two-hour um, lesson series on the issue of modesty. And last year, I was teaching somewhere, and I remember a lady came up to me afterwards, and she said, you know what? I never hear anyone teach on modesty anymore. Now, maybe you do at your church, but a lot of churches, they don't. I went, you're right. I don't hear much about it anymore. But I do think it is a valid issue that I need to address occasionally because we have a responsibility as Christian women to dress in a way that honors Christ. Everything we do should honor Christ. And we are not to look like the immodesty of the world. Uh, Just a few scriptures. 1 Timothy 2, 9 and 10 tells the women very clearly, you are to adorn yourselves in modest apparel. 1 Peter 3, it says, do not let your adornment be merely outward, rather let it be the hidden person of the heart. So that's talking about not only outer beauty, but inner beauty and how important that is. So we do have to be concerned with our outer man. Now, what are the extremes in this balance? If you are too extreme on the inner man, If you're just all about what's going on in the inside, the danger with that and the symptom that you will see is just a self-focus. Okay, you think too much about yourself. You can be very self-absorbed. I put paralysis, excessively concerned about motives. And I put that because I have known a few people that... They were way too focused on this, and they were always agonizing about mainly why they did certain things. And a lot of times it was ministry, okay? They were ministering to other people, and afterwards they would just go on and on about, why did I do that? 
What was I trying to get? Was I trying to impress that person? Was I trying to enhance my reputation? Was I doing that out of pride? I mean, they would just agonize over this. And you know what the end result was? They, they eventually stopped doing anything because they were so worried about having wrong motives for doing it. And so I would just tell them, forget about why you're doing it. Just forget about yourself. Okay, go out there and see a need and minister to as many people as you can and quit trying to analyze why you're doing it. So you can just be a little too inward. You can, uh, the, the word today, you can overthink things, okay? That's a common term. You're overthinking. Um, if you are only concerned about the inner man and you care nothing about the outer man, you can be kind of sloppy, okay? Be careful about that. Um, if you are, now, here's our greater problem in this culture. You can be way too consumed with the outer man, and it results in, again, being very vain. You can just be all about external appearances. I put Phariseeism, and again, let me relate this to parenting. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm a parent. I've got four kids, so I can't help a lot of these. They all go back to how we parent our children. They have implications for that. If you are a mom, let me encourage you, always, always, always deal with your child's heart okay? Not just their external behavior. You want to deal, dig down deep and deal with the heart issues. I mean, our kids can look so good on the outside, okay? They've got all their, you know, yes ma'ams and no ma'ams and table manners, and they look great. They're obeying the rules, but they can be so lost, on the inside, and they can just cover that. Now, what are heart issues? When I say heart issues, what are the heart issues? Mainly things like pride, anger, selfishness, uh, unforgiveness, a refusal to forgive someone. Those are the heart issues that you want to dig down and make sure you're dealing with that. Because if you don't, if you just correct their behavior and you get external compliance and you're satisfied with that, what you are doing is raising a little Pharisee. And they will learn as they get older to cover their hearts and what's really going on in their hearts with good behavior on the outside. So be very careful about that. Again, if you're too much with the outer man, you can have, I put, an excessive desire for physical experiences or for pleasure. You can become a pleasure lover. And again, the Lord is so gracious. He's given us so many things in this world that we can enjoy, okay? It tells us in, I think, Second, First Timothy, he's given us many things to enjoy, but we have to be careful that those things do not become too important to us. Now, I, I cannot totally leave this subject without saying just a few more words about the outer man and about the issue of modesty. Again, I have a two-hour lesson on this, so believe me, you're just getting a little overview. Being too concerned about our appearance is, I think, probably in our culture the most common problem. But again, you can be out of balance the other way. Uh, you can attract attention by being too made up. You can attract attention by not being made up at all and not putting a reasonable amount of effort into our appearance. I don't know about you, but when I wake up in the morning, I'm telling you, I need a little help. Okay, when I look in the mirror, oof, I mean, it's scary, okay? So I always say, why should I, why should I scare my husband? You know, boo, you know. Um, now, again, but you know, I, I take a shower and I wash my hair and put on a little makeup and it's not so bad. But don't go to the extreme. I'm not talking about the extreme. I'm not talking about six hours at the gym every day and tummy tucks and plastic surgery and all that stuff. 
all I'm talking about is putting a reasonable amount of effort into looking presentable, all right? Um, we, I want to be easy on the eyes. I, I don't want to be a distraction. But again, I've known just a handful of ladies in my life. See, when you're as old as I am, I've known a lot of people. So I'm not telling a story when I say I've known some ladies. Um, that, you know, it looks like they woke up in the morning, grabbed their purse, and walked out the door, okay? Um, man, it's just like, comb your hair, okay? Um, I, and I think, I remember having a really in-depth discussion with one lady one time, and I think somehow she thought it was, it was somehow more spiritual if she didn't care about the outside. You know, I'm so focused on spiritual things. And you know, I, I don't want to walk around looking like an unmade bed, okay? So I'm just saying a little bit of effort. Putting, there's just nothing spiritual about that. Putting a reasonable amount of effort, reasonable, into how we look, I just think it's a gracious thing to do for the people that have to look at us all day, okay? Um, there was a lovely lady at our church in California, and she has a famous quote. Um, and I have, I think I put it in, I might have put it in your syllabus. Our character is the picture. Our appearance is the frame. Our frame should complement the picture, not distract from it. Okay, so I don't want to be a distraction. And again, when it comes to modesty, ultimately, it is the man's responsibility. It is his responsibility to guard his eyes, to guard his heart. But we, as Christian women, also have a responsibility not to dress in, a, dress in an immodest or sensual way that would put a temptation in front of them. Um, I tell people, okay, when you stand in front of your, your closet in the morning, three questions, all right? Very simple. Is it too short? Is it too tight? Is it too low? Uh, we have a dear uh, missionary friend in South Africa, and he has given me permission to use what he calls the preposition test, okay? Here's the preposition test. If you can look up it, down it, or through it, don't wear it, okay? <laughs> That's the preposition test. So, um, again, our men, our dear, our husbands, our sons, our brothers, the men in our church, poor things. I feel so sorry for them. I mean, God created most men to be very visually oriented. And in this world, there is temptation everywhere they look. Billboards, movie, TV, newspapers, magazines. There is sensual temptation everywhere. When they come, when our men come to church on Sundays or anytime, they should be able to rest. Okay, just to get a little bit of a respite from that constant temptation. And I think that is a responsibility for us. So here is the balance. Don't pay too much attention to your outer man, to your, uh, to your you know, uh, outer man with all that entails, but don't pay too little either. Okay, be balanced. Um, if you're married, you want to be beautiful for your husband. Um, I want to be pleasant to my husband's eyes. I don't want him to be embarrassed when I'm out at him. Now, you might say, well, my husband should love me for who I am on the inside. And of course he should, and I'm sure he does. But I will quote my father-in-law, who has been with the Lord for many years now. He was a Southern Baptist pastor for about 55 years. So he had a long time time to observe people. And he used to love to say this, this old saying, something about uh, every old barn looks better with a fresh coat of paint. You remember that? Or maybe they don't say that in, in Arizona. Um, now, I have, I have no scripture for that, okay? <laughs> that's, that's just a little Texas uh, humor, but anyway. Okay, let's go on. I always say, I've meddled enough, let's move on. Um, another balance. Okay, we're coming now to my favorite balances, all right? And in the book, these last two chapters, I tell people, if you only read 
couple of things in the book. Read these two chapters because I promise this is my heart for you. Okay, this is what I wrote for people who are going through trials, who are going through suffering, which, let's face it, that's all of us at one time or another. They take a thousand different forms, but we all struggle with that. So the next balance is the balance between reality and hope. Reality can be very difficult sometimes in this world. Reality, let's define the words. Reality has to do with thinking, with evaluation. It has to do with being realistic and seeing the true situation, seeing things as they are. What is hope? Hope has to do with faith. Okay, hope has to do with seeing that unseen world, that unseen kingdom. It has to do with believing the best about people and situations. It has to do with believing that people can change and things can get better. Now, my husband and I have a running joke about optimism and pessimism. He says, I am an optimist, and he is right. Okay, I am an optimist. I am a glass half full person. And I say he is a pessimist. And he said, no, 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 I am not a pessimist. I am a realist, okay? And I'm going, no, you are a pessimist. Um, so we, have, we will never agree on this. But I think, I, hopefully I've helped him to be a little more optimistic. And I think he's helped me be more realistic. Um, let's look at the, the scriptures about this. Psalm 3. And this is when David was running from his son, Absalom. Okay, he's on the run. Absalom is taking over the kingdom. And he, David is in a very difficult position. And in Psalm 3, we see a great example of this. He, he starts off many are they who rise up against me. And yes, these men who David had trained most of them, they were trying to kill David. And he's running. He's in the cave. And he was very realistic, okay? He saw his situation exactly as it was. And he knew how dangerous it was. But what does he do as he, we go through Psalm 3? By the end of Psalm 3, you're hearing him saying, say, you are a shield about me, and I will not be afraid even if thousands come against me. So he was, again, he was realistic about the situation, but what has happened by the end of the psalm? He's praising God, okay? He had learned the balance between hard reality and hope, all right? Um, Romans 8, 28, that's a great example. You know this verse about we know that all things work together for good. The all things, this can be pretty hard, what we're going through, the trials, the suffering, but it's all for good. So there we see that balance. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4, I love this passage where the Apostle Paul, he's talking about all that he went through, and he went through great trials, great suffering. But in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 8 and 9, he says, we are hard-pressed, but we're not crushed. He said, we are perplexed, we're puzzled about what's happened, but we're not in despair. See, Paul, too, had learned the balance between his reality and still maintaining his hope in God. One of my absolute favorite Old Testament stories is found in 2 Kings chapter 6. This is the story of the prophet Elisha. And just very quickly, I'll summarize it for you. You know, back in that day and time, all those different countries, they just, they loved to have wars and battles. They loved to attack each other. And yeah, that's just what they did. So the Syrian army kept coming over to attack the nation of Israel. 
But what would happen, the Syrians would get there, and they would be ready for them. And they would know they were coming. And so the king of Syria gets really fed up with this. And so at first, he thinks he has a traitor. Somebody in his household is telling Israel all his battle plans. And I remember one of his, it says one of his uh, servants says, oh, no, no, no. It's not us. It's that guy, Elisha. It's that prophet over in Israel. And he says, he tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. And so the king of Syria, he says, that's it. Okay, I want this guy, Elisha. Okay, we're going to go get him. So he sends his whole army in the middle of the night to this little town called Dothan, where Elisha and his servant were. And so in the morning, early in the morning, his servant wakes up and goes out to, you know, water the camels or whatever they did. And so he somehow realizes that this army, the Syrian army, is surrounding the town. And he is scared to death. I mean, he is shaken in his boots. He runs back inside to Elisha, and he says, Alas, oh, my master, what are we going to do? Basically, they're going to kill us. And I love Elisha. Okay, Elisha knows his God. And Elisha says, I mean, Elisha's cool. Elisha's calm. He's not worried. And he says, don't worry. He said, they that are with us are more than they that are against us. And then it says he prays. And he prayed to the Lord, Lord, open his eyes. Open the eyes of the servant so he can see. And says the Lord, open the eyes of the servant. And he saw that all around them, the mountains were full of horses and chariots of fire. See, the Lord, in the middle of the night, had sent his heavenly host to protect them. And so the servant, he was being realistic. The Syrian army was there too. But what the servant could not see was that God was there to protect them. And so the servant could not see what I call the real reality. And that was that God was there. God was involved. God was in control. So here is the balance, ladies. We can either call it optimistic realism or realistic optimism. But what it means is that no matter how bad your situation appears, whatever you are in right now, God is sovereign. God is all-powerful. He is all-wise. He is almighty. God is the heart changer. He is the one who always, always brings good out of bad. And if you belong to Christ, if you know the Lord and you are one of his children, there is always hope if you are a child of God. To say there is no hope is actually an attack on the character of God because God is hope. And so we must be careful that we stay balanced and we balance our reality with our hope. If you are too much on the reality side, these are the symptoms. Skepticism, cynicism, pessimism. You will only look on the negative here. You can, and what this leads to, you will become bitter about the things that have happened in your life, and that leads to despair and depression and hopelessness. That's the road that you're going down to if you don't hold on to the hope that God gives us. Now, you can be too extreme on the hope side. You can be so hopeful that you're naive, okay? You can be foolishly optimistic where you are refusing to deal with reality. And that is not helpful either. Okay, You must be realistic 
about your situation, but we never, ever want to lose our hope. All right, let's get into the last balance. And again, this one is very dear to my heart. We'll talk a lot more about this in our last lesson today, but this is the balance between striving and trusting, okay? And this balance is absolutely huge, okay? Because this touches every single part of our lives. And I do want to hasten to clarify this. When I say striving and trusting, when I'm talking about striving, I am not talking about salvation, okay? Salvation is all of grace. It's all God's doing, that in his mercy, he reaches down and saves us. We do not strive to be saved. Um, just like when I was talking about legalism, I wasn't talking about salvation. I was talking about sanctification, which is how we live our lives. And that's what I'm talking about here is sanctification. And that is the balance between your role and God's role in our sanctification and how we live the Christian life. And there are so many scriptures in the Bible that illustrate this. In fact, you see, I gave you a whole list of scriptures, and I probably had about three times that many, so I just tried to pick the best ones. But there are so many scriptures that illustrate this balance. Let me just give you a few. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 4. You know this story about Nehemiah. He was uh, the Israelite that led one of the returns back of all the exiles, the uh, Jewish exiles that had been conquered and taken to other countries. And Nehemiah led one of the groups back to Jerusalem. He got there and was just so distraught because Jerusalem was just in shambles and the wall of Jerusalem had been torn down. So he knew this was really important that they needed to rebuild the wall. So he was in charge of that. So they start rebuilding. And there was a lot of people in Jerusalem that did not want that to happen. They didn't want the Jews to come back into power. So they're trying to sabotage what was happening. So what Nehemiah did, he's a very smart leader. He positioned families on the wall and he gave them weapons, swords, spears, bows and arrows. He put them up there to protect the wall. And so in Nehemiah 4, there's that great little verses. He's giving them a pep talk, okay? He's giving all his workers a pep talk. And he says, remember the Lord, great and awesome. And, oh, yeah, if somebody attacks that wall, fight like crazy, okay? He didn't say, just stand there and praise the Lord, although that's good. He said, no, fight with your weapons, you see, there's a balance there. God had a role, and we had a role, okay? The Lord gives us many commands in Scripture. There are many commands that we are to obey, and we are to serve. We are to pray. We have a role in our sanctification, and God has a role. Proverbs 20, 127.1 says, unless the Lord builds the house, that's his part. They labor in vain who build it. That's our part. Proverbs 2, 7 says, he is a shield, that's his part, to those who walk uprightly. That's our responsibility. That's our part. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, the apostle Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, but who gave the increase? God God is always respons responsible for the results, but we do have a part. One of the best ones is Colossians 1.29, where Paul is speaking, and he says, I labor, that's my part, striving according to what? According to his working. That's his part. So just understand there is a balance between striving, doing everything we know to do, being obedient, and yet still trusting God. In the end, we always have to trust him for the results. If you are too extreme on the striving side, what, if you think it's all up to you, 
you will become self-confident, self-sufficient. You can fall into that works righteousness thing that I talked about, where it's up to me. I've got to do this thing. Uh, that leads to anxiety and fear because it's all up to me, and I'm scared I'm going to fail. If you're too heavy on the trusting side, again, you can be a little too far that direction where you become lazy, where you presume on God. Um, have you ever heard of the uh, let go and let God mentality that was really popular many years ago? And I think we still see it some today. You know, I'm going to just let go and let God. I'm just going to kind of be a blob and just kind of float along here. And I'm not going to do what the Bible tells me to do. Uh, mysticism is a really big symptom here. If you get into mystical stuff, again, just, you know, just kind of very nebulous. I'm not going to really worry too much about all those commands in Scripture. You know, God's going to do it all. No, that is not scriptural. We are given very clear uh, commands in Scripture that we are to follow. So here is the balance in this area. We must be obedient. We must be, do everything we can to live holy lives, to live lives that honor God. But we also have to learn to rest in the Lord and trust Him for the results. Because many things are out of our control. So we do what we can. I love the Mary and Martha story that we find in Luke chapter 10. And if we're honest, I think most of us, I know I do, we tend to be Marthas, okay? We tend to bustle around and try and take care of everything. Um, think back to that story just real briefly. Okay, I, I've always wondered if... Martha, if Mary and Martha did not know that Jesus was coming that day, somehow I wonder if he just kind of uh, surprised them. Hey, I'm here. Um, and Martha, okay, she is, I mean, she's back in the kitchen. I mean, she is, you know, she's got one hand on the microwave and one on the stove. And she's, I mean, she's bustling around. She's getting dinner ready. And Mary, where's Mary? She's sitting out on the front porch, you know, Jesus is in the rocker, and she's sitting there at his feet listening to him, listening to what he's saying. And the more Martha did back in the kitchen, and the less Mary did, the madder Martha got. Okay, she was in, in Texas, we would say she was in a tizzy. Okay, so Martha got in a tizzy, and finally, she can't take it anymore, and she storms out there to the front porch, and when you read that, I mean, how she spoke to the Lord was awful. I mean, she goes out there, and she says, look, Jesus, um, my sister is being lazy, and you're encouraging her, and I'm back in the kitchen about to work myself to death. So if it wouldn't put you out too much, I'd appreciate it if you would tell my sister to get back there and help me. Okay, and I have paraphrased that, okay? Um, I think that's what she was saying. But it was so disrespectful. How she was basically telling him what to do. And Jesus, as he always is, was so kind, so gracious. And he went right to the heart of the issue, and he said, Martha, Martha, you're bothered about so many things that don't matter, but Mary has chosen the best thing, which is listening to his word, which was being with him. Uh, Spurgeon says this about Mary and Martha. He said, Martha's fault was not that she served, let us do all that we know to do. It was no fault of hers that she was busy preparing a feast for the master. Her fault was that she grew cumbered with much serving so that she forgot him and only remembered the service. She allowed her service, her striving, to override her communion. 
We ought to be Mary and Martha in one. We need to be balanced. We should do much service and have much communion at the same time. And for this, we need great grace because it is much easier to serve than to just commune. It's easy to be busy, all right? So we need to strive for that balance. One more area where striving and trusting is so important, once again, is in our parenting. Let me encourage you, if you are a mom, give give it all you have got, okay? Be the very best mom you know how to do. Love your children. Build a strong, trusting, loving relationship with your children. Put everything you've got into them. But I'm telling you, in the end, you can't control them. You have to trust the Lord, okay? They are in his hand, and that's where the trusting comes in. In conclusion, ladies, as we wrap up, we must understand that living the Christian life is a high-wire endeavor. We are called as believers to cross this narrow thread called life, realizing that there are dangers on either side that can plunge us into spiritual disaster or despair. But there is a key to every successful high-wire act, and it's very simple. When you're on the wire, you have to keep your balance. There's one other thing I want you to think about. In every high wire performance, what if is the one object that you always see? It is something called the balance bar. Okay? If you've seen those acts, it's a long bar that they hold in their hands that keeps them balanced. See, when we try to balance, we tend to sway from side to side. But I want you to understand, as believers, we have a balance bar, and that is the word of God to help keep us balanced. Jonathan Edwards said this, truly holy affections in a saint are balanced. This is the dominant trait of their sanctity. The whole image of Christ is impressed upon them. There is in him every grace, and he is full of grace and truth. Christ is our picture of perfect balance. He was perfectly balanced. He never spoke when he should not have. He never did anything that he should not have. He was perfect. He knew exactly what to do. And so he is our example We want him to work in us to make us more Christ-like, more like him. As we close, I'll give you an interesting postscript to the Walinda family. Carl, the patriarch, died in a fall in 1978 in Puerto Rico. He had a great quote that I love. It said this. He said, life is being on the wire and everything else is just waiting. I thought, how that applies to us. To me, life is knowing Christ, and everything else is just waiting. I'm sure that you have heard, actually, of Carl's great-grandson, a man named Nick Walenda. And you're here in Arizona. Um, Nick today has has gained fame because he follows the family tradition, and he has become famous in recent years for crossing tight ropes over landmarks like the Grand Canyon. Okay, he walked across the Grand Canyon. I don't know why anyone would do that, but he did. Um, He walked across Niagara Falls. He walked across downtown Chicago. Uh, He walked across Times Square. So Nick Walenda is Carl's great-grandson. 
But who I want to tell you about as we close is actually one of Carl's grandsons. And he is a man, he's still alive today. His name is Tino Walenda. Tino and his family, he has four children, continue the family tradition today, performing their amazing act all over the world. In fact, back in 1998, Tino took his children and they went back to Detroit, where as an 11-year-old boy, Tino watched his father fall to his death. They went back 36 years later to the exact same arena and with his children successfully performed the three-level pyramid. As Tino would say later, they wanted to show that disaster does not have to end in defeat. But the main thing about Tino is that he boldly professes his faith in Jesus Christ. And a few years ago, he wrote an article in a Christian magazine, and this is what he said. When I was seven years old, my grandfather, Carl Walenda, put me on a wire two feet off the ground. He taught me all the elementary skills, how to hold my body, how to place my feet, how to hold the pole. But the most important thing that my grandfather ever taught me was that I needed to focus my attention on a point at the other end of the wire. I need a point to concentrate on to keep me balanced. The ultimate focus of my life is Jesus Christ. The Bible says that we need to focus our eyes on a Jesus, on a fixed point, which is Jesus. He is the author and the perfecter of our faith, and we focus our eyes on Jesus. At one time or another, I have taken each of my four children on my shoulders as I have walked across the wire. In those situations, the children cannot do any balancing. I am the one who has to balance and support them. People have asked them, aren't you scared? No, they say. And when they've been asked, why aren't you scared? They have answered, because that's my daddy. They have confidence in me because I'm their daddy. And I have confidence in my heavenly father. And I know that he will take me all the way across this chasm of life until I meet him face to face. So my prayer for all of us today is that as we walk across this chasm of life, as Tino called it, the Lord will keep us balanced through his holy word and will enable all of us to live lives that will bring glory to him. Let's close. Father, we bow before you. We worship you. Lord, we love you. And we thank you so much just for all the blessings you give us. We thank you for just giving us this time to be together. We thank you for Jesus who died for us. We thank you for the spirit that helps us and encourages us. We thank you for your precious word. And Lord, I pray that you would help each one of us to be balanced in our lives. I pray that you would give us direction and wisdom as we seek to honor you. I pray that you would help us to analyze our lives, that you would open our eyes to the areas where we may be out of balance, where we may be going to the extreme. And Lord, bring us back to the center. And we need your help desperately for this because we are frail, we are faulty, and we often make wrong decisions. We make wrong choices. And Lord, we praise you that you are sovereign. And you can even take our mistakes. And somehow you amazingly always bring good out of them. You always somehow glorify yourself, even through what we would see as mistakes. And 
You are an amazing God that you do that. So, Father, we love you, and we just ask for your help in all these areas. I pray for every lady here. Give, them, give each one of them encouragement. Give them wisdom in dealing with situations in their own lives, and give them your hope. And we pray all this in your name, your precious name. Amen.